everyone. Um, I, uh, I'm going to alter this message a little bit, uh, given that, you know, Pastor Paul has just given some information, which was the uh, sort of like the, the, the kind of like that missing piece that I was preparing this message, and I was like, eh, it's missing something. Um, and I guess uh, that was the missing piece that I was waiting for. Um, and so let me pray, and then we'll get into the message this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for giving us this morning, giving us your word, giving us your wisdom and your guidance, Lord God, so that we may live our lives um, to the fullest, Lord, so that we would understand that you are the author and you're the perfecter of our faith, Lord, that in everything that we do, that you have preordained it so that we would understand um, your guidance and your hands upon our lives, Lord, bringing us closer into your hearts and to understand your love and compassion for each one of us. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I have actually lived a very short life, but a very, not, not lived, as in past tense, I'm not dead yet, but um, a short life, but it has been filled with excitement, and, 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 and uh, I think the presence of God, and I thank God for that. I didn't do anything special. I, I'm not praying more than any of you. I'm not, I'm not reading the Bible or living a more holy life. It just... For some reason, uh, God has just uh, given me a more blessed life than I deserve. I guess that's a that's a way that I would put it. Um, and so, let me just give a little bit more context to what Pastor Paul just shared earlier. Uh, when I was around 18, after graduation from high school, there was a call uh, to go into the missions down in Mexico for two weeks. And so I uh, jumped at the chance. And another pastor here, uh, Pastor uh, uh, Jung, uh, Joshua. Uh, who is now serving God over in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, with his family. Uh, we both um, hop onto this bus, really old bus, and we went down to Mexico, Baja, California, actually, a uh, place I, I love, Black Sand Beach. If you ever have ever had a chance to go, it's, uh, it's wonderful down there. Um, uh, we didn't actually see the beach until the very last day before we came back. So um, before that, uh, it was, uh, so I just want to give a little bit more context to why it is that we were building the outhouse. And so, uh, when we were traveling down there, uh, you know, I didn't have any expectations at all. We just were like, okay, uh, we're going to go down to Mexico and we're going to build a church. And so it sounds wonderful. It sounds like, um, you know, mission worthy. Uh, anyone who is like, uh, you know, young would want to be a part of that. And so we, we went. And so pa Pastor Joshua and I, uh, we went with the team, uh, went down there, and we, the first moment we went down there, um, uh, we were going through Mexico. As soon as you pass the border from, from California, uh, U.S., into Mexico, you see the, the, the difference right away. Um, people were, like, living in, like, cardboard houses down there. You know, like now, you, you see it a little bit on the street, and you're like, that's a little bit different. Well, back then, it was already like that, back um, down in, in that part of Mexico that we went into. And so we went into this uh, field where the bus parked, and there was literally nothing at all. There was just an open field, and the bus parked, and we p pitched the tents. The ground was so hard, we couldn't even put the stake down to, to keep the tent down. Um, there was no way for us to actually stake the tent down. Um, and that's how hard the, the ground was. At first, we were trying to dig up the dirt to build a foundation to the church by hand. And after, you know, a couple of hours of doing that, uh, our hands were, you know, the wrist hurt so much um, that we couldn't do it anymore. They actually start taking out this uh, jackhammer to break up the ground. That's how hard the ground was. It's like almost like a clay-like consistency, but it's very hard. And so they took out the jackhammer and dug up the, the, the surrounding portion of the foundation and then, um, you know, starting the work of, you know, putting down uh, concrete with uh, rebar and stuff like that to build the foundation of the church. And so I didn't have any special technical, uh, you know, like uh, uh, technical knowledge in terms of building. And so that's how we got into the digging of the foundation part, or <laughs> particularly the, the outhouse part. So uh, the, uh, the carpenters built the part that is on top where everybody sees. And because we have uh, no skill at all, I have no skill at all, uh, my job was to essentially put the dirt into the bucket after it had been dug up and pull it up. That's my job. Pull the dirt that has been dug up um, into the bucket to be able to, be able to t take it out of the ditch. 
Uh, the toilet measure 10 feet by 12 feet by 10 feet deep. So that's how big the toilet is. I'm not surprised it's not filled by now because that's quite a big toilet. Um, you know, I have a little bit of experience in terms of toilet digging because that's how we did it back in the day when I was younger in Vietnam. We didn't have any houses at all. So we went down to, into the, you know, I'm, my, my excuse here um, is that, you know, we didn't have indoor plumbing. So we just went down to the backyard and we dug up ditches and, you know, we do our business down there. Um, and then cover up the, the you know, uh, whatever part of that with dirt so the dog won't go after it. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, I remember distinctly one night, uh, they asked for a volunteer to sleep out there in the field. The reason why is because there were a lot of equipment out um, in the field, and if there was no one there, essentially anyone at all can come in and just take the, the equipment, the jackhammer, the generator, whatever it is that's out there. So I kind of volunteer because I, I, I'm the, the least skilled labor down there, so I figure I'll make myself useful by being a, a watchman for the night. And I remember uh, just laying out there. I mean, it, it, was, it was better for sure because the difference between laying out there in the tractor with, with a cushion is a little bit better than sleeping in my sleeping bag on the ground. That's really hard. So, you know, I was like, ah, oh, you know, it's not that much of a difference. So I remember I was sitting there, um, you know, looking out at the dark night and, uh, you know, to this pitch dark field, um, wondering if anybody at all would gonna come by and steal stuff and what I'm gonna do if they do. <laughs> you know, it's not, not as if like I'm like this tough guy or, you know, whatever the case might be. I figure, you know, if people come and steal stuff, I'd just be like, uh, you, you need help with that? I, I can help you carry it. <laughs> I'm certainly not gonna put up a fight. <laughs> you know, so I was just laying out there and thinking about it and I was like, you know, like, um, you know, what is, what is the, the point of going all the way down here for two weeks to essentially um, dig up dirt to build a toilet? It seems like it's not mission. It's not, it's not what I had envisioned in the back of my mind when I was going on a mission field. Um, it feels like so below what it is that I could be doing, you know? And um, it feels like it wasn't really mission. I wasn't really reaching out to anyone. I wasn't really doing anything that is worthwhile. I wasn't doing anything that would expand the kingdom of God. I was not doing anything other than digging up a toilet. How, how can that be mission? How can that be expanding the kingdom of God? And so that's me back then, some almost 30 years ago. And me today, looking at it and said that was mission. And I think that that's a good segue for us to go into the word today, transformation part two, where we take a look at everything that we do in life. And we often would ask the question, how can this be the will of God for me? How can this be what I'm going through right now? How can that be the will of God for me? It seems so mundane, not even mundane. It seems so pointless. I'm struggling. I'm going through things that other people don't seem to struggle with. I'm failing. I, I'm, I'm not even living a purpose-driven life like everybody else is. There's no meaning to my existence. What I'm doing seems so meaningless. How can that be the will of God? I'm digging up a hole for a toilet for crying out loud. A really big one, but a toilet nonetheless. How can that be the will of God for my life? It just seems so not it. I want to be greater. I want to be a part of something much more grand, much more meaningful. Uh, how can th this be the will of God for me? So let's get into um, Transfiguration Part 2. And I think that that's, that's um, you know, if we are ever wondering uh, what we're going through, is the will of God. I think that that's essentially the mindset that I had. It's like I was laying there in the middle of this field. Can't even be the guardsman because I can't stop anybody from taking stuff. And I'm just there digging up a toilet hole for two weeks. Not even being a part of something that is structural in terms of the building. I'm, I'm a part of the deconstruction part, part of, the, of the construction plan, right? 
I'm just digging up dirt. I'm not even a part of the group that actually builds anything. Anyways, um, so we're going to be taking a look at a few uh, different verses here. Mark chapter 9, verse uh, 5 through 13, Matthew 17, 4 through 13, and then Luke chapter 9, 32 to 36. Um, and uh, these are all talking about the same uh, aspect of the same event, the transfiguration, the second part. Um, so here, you will see uh, in Exodus, so I'm going to begin with Exodus first, so that um, you know we, we'll go through and we'll take a look at two different passages. First, in Exodus chapter 14, talk about Moses. Second part, Second King chapter 2, talk about Elijah, because these are the two figures that showed up uh, with Jesus on top of this mountain during the transfiguration. Four, uh, 15 slides, so two minutes per slide, take about half an hour or so. Just want to give you a, a gauge. So if you are going to sleep, that's how long you have to sleep before you have to wake up. Okay. So first, uh, Exodus chapter 14, uh, verse 15 through 16. Very simple. Is this thing working? Okay. Can you um, just show the verse? Yeah, it's too small, small for me to read. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelite to move on. You almost see it feels like there's a sense of like uh, annoyance from God almost. Like, I've already told you what to do. Why don't you just go ahead and do it? Um, and that's, I guess that's kind of like me feeling about, you know, me going down to Mexico and God saying, why are you complaining about this? This is what I told you to do. You go ahead and do it. And like what I said at the beginning, I feel very blessed at this point because I've always been sort of like being dragged along by God into the, you know, whatever it is. And only do I come out of it feeling blessed afterward. And I feel like that right now. But during that period of time, I never really feel like God um, calling or being at the center of what it is that God wants me to see. It's more often that I'm not involved in doing anything great, but I'm in the midst of witnessing great things being done. Um, so I'm not a part, an active participant, but more like a, you know, sort of like a, just someone who is able to be there and stand there and watch what God is doing. Verse 16, raise your staff and stretch out your hands over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. Um, and then in Exodus chapter 14, 21 to 22, uh, this is what it says. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night, the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The water were divided. Verse number 22, and the, Israel, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. And what you can see here is that the, the very first thing that I came to a realization is that if there is a strong wind blowing through this whole time, and as people are walking through, if the, if the wind is strong enough to blow the water apart, uh, I'm certain that I'm not a very big person, that I'll probably be blown too, right? <laughs> Any of us would be blown. So there's a miracle here. There's nothing that you and I can explain away that, oh, this is something that is we can replicate by blowing a very strong wind and it's going to split up the water. It's not something that we can explain. This is a miracle in and of itself. And so I don't try to go and explain why and how this can happen. I'm simply taking this as a miracle. If a strong wind blowing, there's, there are women, men, old, young, they're going to get blown. And the, very, the, and the other fact is that if this is at the bottom of the sea, it's going to be very wet, right? And it, even if the water were to separate, that ground would be muddy. There's no way that all those people would be able to walk easily through. So it, had, it must be dry ground. So how does that ground get dry? That, that in and of itself cannot be explained by this. Even if you were to blow the, the bottom of the ocean overnight, it's not going to dry to the point where you can walk over it. If you ever have a wet carpet, it takes a night <laughs> to dry your, just your wet carpet alone. This is the bottom of the sea. So I just take it as this. Moses does something here that takes incredible faith. God says, stretch out your hand over the sea, and it's going to split. And he, what does he do? He went and he go, I'm going to stretch out my hand over the sea and let it split. See, I, he is very different than me. I take a look at this, and I say, Moses is a man of faith. He doesn't question anything that God says. He simply just does it. God says, stretch out your hand. He does it. That's why um, in Hebrew chapter 11, when it talks about faith, talk about Moses. 
Talk about how he led the people of Israel out of um, Egypt through this parting of the water through faith. This is what it's talking about. I don't have this kind of faith. Um, and so here what we can see is that, again, I just want to focus in on the fact that this is a miracle. I, I don't try to explain this. I don't try to reason it. I don't try to use some sort of scientific method to be able to explain why this happened. And they went through this dry part of the sea that was created because of this faith that Moses had. Second King chapter two verse six through seven, you very see a very similar event happen. Then Elijah said to him, "Stay here. The Lord has sent me to Jordan." And he replied, "As surely as the Lord lives, and as you live, I will never, I will not leave you." So the two of them walk on. Here we're talking about Elijah and Elisha. Elijah says, "Stay here. I'm going to go forward into Jordan." This is the third time that Elijah told Elisha to stay where he is at, because this is the point where God is going to take Elijah. To heaven. And so he didn't want Elisha to see him leave. Um, the, the, the goodbye part, this brings us back to the communion where Jesus is saying goodbye to his, to his disciples. Very, very similar in, in, for me when I was reading it. Very similar. It's like there's a heart-wrenching part where you, know, you have spent a long time with a disciple and you feel like leaving them is, is, um, is very difficult. And so Elijah said to Elijah, stay here. And uh, he said, no, I'm going to go with you. Even though Elisha knows that this is the moment where God is going to take his master up, he wants to, to see Elijah, Elijah leave. In verse number seven, seven, 50 men from the company of prophets went and stood at a distance facing the place uh, where Elijah and Elisha had stopped at the Jordan. Again, here, I'm just going to circle this this uh, here for a moment here. Here we have a completion of the circle where it brings us back to the Jordan. And at the Jordan is where Jesus was baptized. And so everything that Elijah and Elisha is doing here, Elijah in particular, because this is one of the two figures at the, ho at the top of the mountain during uh, the transfiguration. And so Elijah leads us right back to the Jordan where Jesus picks up and uh, started the ministry after his baptism. And so we see here a complete circle. Elijah is coming back to the Jordan and leaving earth at this particular point. And this is where Jesus picks up Elijah's ministry and continues. Okay. I'm painting all of this out so that you know later on when we're talking about transfiguration, we have all of that in the, the back of our mind. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided uh, to the right and to the left, and two of them cross over dry ground. Again, we see here the splitting of the water, baptism in a way, where Moses led the people through the water, and Elijah leads um, him and his disciples through this water at the Jordan. And it is the same way that Jesus is leading the rest of humanity through the water into the promised land, into heaven. And there is the sim similarity between all these events. And the only difference, and we'll come to this in a little bit, the only difference is that where all these, uh, Moses and Elijah is only able to do this in the flesh, Jesus is able to do it in the spirit so that he can bring us into the gate of heaven. So I just want to come back and remind everyone of something that we talked about many weeks ago, and that's in Luke. This is the first part of the transfiguration. Luke chapter 9, verse 28 to 31, this is what it says. About eight days after Jesus said this, I'm going to go uh, and having to suffer and sacrifice. Uh, uh, about eight days after Jesus had said this, he, went, he took Peter, John, James with him and went in, uh, unto a mountain to pray. And so you can see here, there's an image here where Jesus is leading his disciples up into the mountain. And Moses, when he met the Lord, was in Mount Horeb. Right, and Elijah, when he was uh, when he ran away from uh, the Queen Jezebel, he also ran into the mountain of God, Mount Horeb. And so, a lot of people feel like this is the same Mount Horeb that Jesus took the three disciples into. And so, we see the convergence of these three people going up to the Mount of God, Mount Horeb. And at that convergence is where we see that where the ministry of Moses and Elijah ended. That's where Jesus' ministry begins. Okay? As they, uh, and he went up there to pray. In verse two, number 29, as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became bright as flashing 
uh, as a flash of lightning, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in, uh, in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus. And so here we see the convergence of these three individuals. They all went to Mount Horeb together, and, that, and they're meeting right there. They're talking about something. And we have already talked a little, a little bit about this already. And so they're talking about, they spoke about his departure, but this word here, let me remind you again, is not as we see, it's, it's not death. But it really is a journey, an exodus. Just like Moses, in the book of Exodus, lead the people out of captivity, out of slavery, into um, freedom, into the will of God, into the place where they can worship God. Remember, that's what God wanted, is to take the children of Israel out of Egypt so that they can go to the mountain of God and to worship him. So this departure, this journey that they have gone out of to go towards something, that's what they're talking about. And so, again, I just wanted to bring back to uh, remembrance here is that in Hebrew chapter 11, where we re referenced this before, talk about faith, right? In Hebrew chapter 11, verse 1, talk about the, the, it defined what faith is. And, in, and for the rest of that chapter, Paul lays out all the step of faith, all the act of faith that all the people in history has, has already demonstrated. And in one of those uh, instances, talk about um, Joseph. And Joseph, even though he had already died, right, that's a different word than departing, when he was about to die, he instructed his people uh, to take his bones into the promised land. So even when you and I have already died, we have not completed the purpose of God yet. So even after our bones is only there, after our flesh has already decayed, we can still live in the will of God. And that's what this is really talking about. And so here we see the continuance of what we think of as death, as the end of all things. In the biblical sense, in the spiritual sense, our death, our natural death, isn't the end. There is something that still continues to move forward until we accomplish the will of God. And that's really where this is. Right? And so we talk about this word uh, in, he, uh, in Greek called tell you tao, right, in the upper right-hand corner there, tell you tao, um, and that is to finish. Well, there is another term in Hebrew chapter uh, 12, verse 1 through 2, and that's the one I'm talking about right now. And so we see here, and this is what it says in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, and this is referring back to chapter 11, where it talks about all the historical people who have demonstrated their faith, which I lack totally when I'm reading this. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sins that so easily ensnares, and let us run with preservations the race marked out for us. You can see here that there is this thing where Paul is describing to us. Each of our journey is different. Each of our lives are different. Each of the callings are different. Each of the things that, are, that we're experiencing are very different. It's been marked out, designed specifically for each one of us. Let us run that particular path with perseverance, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And what he's saying here is that he, here, what he's saying is that, look, Moses did all of that. He lived a faithful life, but he did not, and you can see this too. You go back to the end of chapter 11, it says that they did not fulfill, they did not see or they did not receive the, the, the purpose of God until Jesus completed, perfected it. And so this is what, uh, what Paul is trying to say here, is that all those people, they lived their faithful life and they were treated very badly in this life, but that's not the point. The point is that it will only be, pre -per be perfected when Jesus comes, when Jesus perfect their faith, right? So he says here, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and uh, the perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so he, we see here what Paul is essentially saying is that, look, you're looking at this, this point in time in the transfiguration, and you see two figures appearing there, Moses and Elijah. Each one of them lived this great life of faith. 
But they didn't accomplish anything. And it was because it has been already been designed that way. It is never going to be accomplished by them in the flesh. It's only going to be perfected by Jesus himself when he comes. And so they met at this point at the top of the mountain, and then from there on out, Jesus do the work that perfected their life. They only found perfection. Their lives only has meaning. The work that they did only have meaning when Jesus come and bring it to perfection. And it is similarly for you and I today. Perhaps we're going through whatever it is. We're going through trials and tribulations. We're going through hardship. We're going through sins. We're going through the things that hinders us from seeing the will of God. We're going through things where we're like, we're struggling with and we're asking, is this the will of God for me? Is this what my life is really about? Is this all that I'm going to be able to contribute to this life? I have done nothing at all in this life at all. I have not set a single stone in any building that would construct the house of God. I have not broken a single timber to be able to build the roof of God. So how can it be that I'm contributing to anything meaningful in this life for God at all? And so maybe you're asking that question, how can it be that I can do anything for God at all? And it is not until we realize that we need to fix our eyes upon Jesus. He is going to be the person who is going to take our life and bring meaning to it and makes that faithful life have purpose and perfection. And so you see here Moses, Elijah, and every other figure you can think of, their life is meaningless until Jesus meets them at the top of the mountain and bring to it his meaningful conclusion. You and I are going to be the same thing. I could end the message here and tell you that. Perhaps today you're going through things that you don't understand. Perhaps today you're going through things that you're struggling with. Maybe it is sin. Maybe it is addiction. Maybe it is the lack of will to do anything. Maybe it is depression. Maybe it is whatever it is that you're struggling with and you're asking the question, is this all my life is going to amount to? Failure depression, things that I don't really see any point to. But here Paul gives us such an important key, which is fix our eyes upon Jesus. Whatever it is that we're going through, no one can understand. Whatever it is that we're struggling with, no one can understand. No one can come by and tell us why it is that we're going through it. But when we fix our mind upon Jesus when we fix our eyes upon Jesus, to believe that he is the person who initiated our faith and he is going to bring it to its meaningful conclusion, the perfecter of our faith, then we will have faith that he will make that come to pass. If you were to tell Moses, hey, you are failure. You didn't even make it into the promised land. Or you tell Elijah, hey, you are failure. You weren't able to get people to come back to worship God. At that point in their life, they're like, yeah, maybe I'm running away from a woman and I don't even know what, why. <laughs> I don't even know why I'm afraid of her. I'm not, I, I don't know. I'm just interpreting what Elijah might be thinking. But you can see here is that, yeah, maybe they have those thoughts. They have, Moses followed God faithfully for more than 40 years, doing everything that God has told him, to stretch out his hand to see the water split Right? They do great and incredible faithful things, and you look at it and say, I've never done anything like that. I've never rolled up my rope and strike the water so it can split in two. I've done nothing great at all. How can it be that I'm living in the will of God? But it's not only until we fix up our eyes upon Jesus and say, you are the person who have designed this life. You have given me a race. I'm going to faithfully do it. I'm going to faithfully follow this. Through all the hardship, through all the trials, I'm just going to fix my eyes upon Jesus. Believing that all of these things will make some sense one day when we meet Jesus. It's kind of like Joseph, right? When he was like being cast down in the ditch by his brother, how can that be the will of God? Being sold out by his friends, how can that be the will of God? Even when you're not doing anything wrong, people wrong you, and you ask the question, how can this be the will of God? How can this be a blessing that God has given me? Right? 
So not until we fix our eyes upon Jesus and say he is the one who is going to bring meaning to all of this. And we can see where Joseph's life ends. We can see where Moses' life ends. And they all only have meaning because what Jesus does for us today. So let us go back and take a look at, um, oh, and one other part is that perfecto here has the same root as uh, finish or death. We only find meaning in death, in the end of this natural life, when we find it in Jesus, because they have the same root, right? And you can see here, perfection is not in death, but in Jesus, the perfecter of our faith. So we're going to go through and we're going to look at a couple of verses. So one of the things about this, um, we're going to see three accounts here. One in Mark, one in Luke, and one in John. Um, sorry, one in Mark, Luke, and one in Matthew. And they're all a little bit different. And unless we approach this with faith, we're going to see that, which, how, do I, how should I believe this? How can this be that the accounts are kind of different from here to here? How can it be? What do I believe in? So I'm just going to lay out a case here. Mark chapter 9, verse 5 through 6. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what, he was, <laughs> what to say. Uh, they were so frightened. What it says here is that they were so scared. And so Peter was just blurting out things he had no idea. So to me, that's what it's saying here, is that there isn't anything significant about what Peter is saying. He's just so frightened that he's just saying whatever comes to his mind, right? Um, and that's very typical of, uh, of Peter, as I understand him. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 4 to 6, this is a similar passage. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciple heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. So you can see here it's a little bit different. Matthew is requiring, again, Matthew, Mark, and Luke were not, were not there at this particular event. They really just reheard it from, um, uh, from the three disciples, Peter, um, Andrew, and and uh, John, who were at the, at the event. So each one of them heard it and, and recall or wrote down something slightly different. Here you can see that Matthew, what Matthew is saying is that they were afraid because God appeared and he spoke, and they were so scared of that. That's why um, they fell face down, terrified. Um, and then what we can see here is in Luke chapter 9, 32 to 33, this is what it says. Peter and his companion were very sleepy, but when they came to fully awake, they saw the glory and the two men standing with him. Verse number 33, as the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and on one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. Again, we can see here is that what they all agreed on is that Peter didn't know what he was talking about, but they couldn't really agree on how that happened. So um, I just want to point that out. And so if we were to say, you know, if there is perfection in the Word of God, in the Bible, then they should all match. They should all have perfect agreement among each other. And, uh, but here we see a little bit different. So should I believe? Should I have faith in these words? Should I have faith in these recounts? Or because they're different, that, you know, maybe this is not right. Somebody got it wrong. Mark chapter 9, verse 7 through 9. And here, the recounting of uh, God appearing to them. Then a cloud appeared and covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Slightly different. Certainly, when they look around, they, saw, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus gave them the order not to tell anyone what they have seen until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Okay, so this is Mark's uh, account. Okay, so here I just wanted to highlight a couple of things. That's what Mark is saying God says. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. So just keep that in the back of your mind. 
And then the other part is that Jesus is instructing the three disciples not to say anything until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Okay? And so here in Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, 6, and 9, this is what it says. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud says, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Listen to him. It's slightly different, but it's very similar to Mark. Okay? When the disciple has heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus instructed them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Very similar to Mark, right? So that's the only thing that I wanted to point out here. And then when we were looking at Luke chapter 9, verse 34 to 36, this is what it says. I'm sorry, I'm lisping a little bit. My tongue is like, I, I had um, um, teeth pull, pull out. So I'm, I'm still trying to get used to this. Um, so I'm sorry if my, my um, pronunciation is a little weird. While he was still speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. So a little bit different, right? When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciple kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. Very different than the other two accounts. So if we were to simply just focus on the differences between the three writers in the Gospels, and we say, okay, so how am I supposed to interpret this? How do I, how do I know that this is all telling the same thing and that they all, whatever the case might be? Sometimes they're not all in agreement in, in ways that we want to, we want it to be perfect agreement between all of them for us to say, yeah, that's exactly what happened. It requires a certain amount of faith for us to say, okay, they're all talking about something very similar. They're all recalling something that they heard from the three disciples. Remember, Luke, um, Matthew, and Mark were not there at the top of the mountain. They heard this after some time, after Jesus has passed away. And so there are some differences. So Mark chapter 11, thir uh, thir 11 through 13. Mark chapter 9, verse 11 through 13. This is where um, we will find our conclusion. So sometimes when we're reading the word of God, we struggle a little bit and ask the question, are people right? The people out there says, you know, the Bible is just a collection of different stories that have already been out there before it. They just rehash it, rewrite it, make it into somehow, um, you know, this Christian Bible. But, you know, it's really a, a collection of different things that, you know, the writer back there has, has heard. And it's not really anything true. You shouldn't put any stake in it. Uh, particularly if you were to go back and look at the story of Moses um, and the Red Sea, the part in the Red Sea, there are a lot of things that people have written out there that says, you know, that is not really historical. It's really is the Reed Sea and not the Red Sea. I, I won't go too much into that. But um, perhaps sometimes, you know, our, our faith in the Bible is shaken. Our faith in God is shaken because of what people describe and things like that. And certainly here, too, when you, we take a look at the gospel and there are disagreement about, you know, what is being written here, we ask the question, should I believe in this? Is this true? Is this real? Should I put my entire life, base my entire life on this when there are disagreement. In verse number 11 it says, and they asked him, why do the teachers of the law say Elijah must come first? This is the same question that the disciple asked Jesus. This is what the law says. This is what the, the Bible says. This is what the, the, the expert is saying. Elijah must come first. Well, how do you explain that to us? We have those doubts in us. We hear what people say and we then look at Jesus and say, this is what you're saying now. How can that be right? right? So the disciple back then have the same questions that we have today. How can this be the meaning of God for me? How can this be the chosen life that God has for me if he loves me? How can it be that God, so merciful, so loving, allow the world to go through so many wars, through whole, so many hardships, through so many different events that we cannot even comprehend? How can there there's be this much suffering if X, Y, and Z are happening? So there are a lot of questions that we have in the back of our mind. And the question, and, and it shakes us in terms of our faith because those questions are legitimate. 
Jesus replied, to be sure, Elijah does come first and restore all things. Why then? It is written that the Son of Man must suffer much and be rejected. But I tell you, Elijah has come, and they have done to him everything they wish, just as it is written about him. Here, I just want to focus on one thing here, is that people will believe in whatever they want. They will say whatever they want. They will satisfy whatever needs that their mind and their hearts and their spirits have based on whatever it is that is in front of them. For example, we may be able to say, well, I can't really believe in an all-merciful, all-loving God because the world has so much suffering, so much homeless on the streets, so much death, two babies die in a swimming pool. You know, like, how does that make any sense? Why doesn't someone or something intervene? Why doesn't God intervene in that and save their lives? Uh, and so on and so forth. So how does that make sense? How do I reconcile what people are saying about what is written about this God versus what I'm seeing and experiencing in my own life? And so here, I just want to hi highlight a couple of, of, of things here. They really question Jesus. They really put forward to him something that someone else has already said. Maybe that's what you and I are doing today. We're really asking God, how can it be? How can my life be this way? Or how can the world be this way? Or how can this X, Y, and Z be happening if you're saying this? Matthew 17, um, 10 to 13, very, very similar. His disciple asked him, why then? And you can see here, too, is that Luke doesn't have any of this in his recount. Um, so it's just in, in Mark and Matthew. Matthew chapter 17, 10 to 13, it says, the disciple asked him, why then do they, the teachers of the law say that Elijah must come first? Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him. But they have done to him everything they wish, in the same way that the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hand. Then the disciple understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. And so here, in, in, in the word of Matthew, is, it clarifies a little bit more. It says there in verse number 12, Elijah has already come, they did not recognize him. There is something fundamental about we as people, is that th we can either choose to look at something and believe, or we can choose at something and reject. They did not recognize. In their mind, they have already rejected John the Baptist. This doesn't look like a, a man of God. This doesn't look like Elijah. This doesn't look like X, Y, and Z, because in my mind, it's different. For you and I, Today is the same thing. We can take a look at something. For me, it's like looking at a toilet. This is not the will of God. I reject this toilet to be the will of God. I reject this work that I'm doing as menial as the will of God. I'm, re I'm rejecting the suffering that I'm going through because that cannot be the will of God for me because the will of God for me has to be something grand and great. I have to save somebody. I have to bring someone into the kingdom of God. I have to set the cornerstone of the, the church building for that to be the will of God. It has to be something miraculous. I have to be able to split open the water of the sea. I have to do something that no one else can do, and that is the will of God. Not this menial thing, not this thing that I, you know, am struggling with, not the sin that I'm committing a daily day and every, you know, I'm, I'm just powerless to overcome it. We reject the thing because we don't recognize God in it. But have done to him everything they wish. And so we just continue to live our lives the way that we want to, not recognizing that, that those very things that God has placed in our lives, it is his will for us to go through, to understand, to comprehend, and to be able to come back and say, that is the will of God for me, and I'm waiting for Jesus to bring it to perfection. And so I just want to highlight that and bring back to this last slide and conclude here. Perfection is only found in Jesus. And let me just read this passage one more time. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, all the people who have gone up before us, all the testimonies that we have heard, all the imprisonments, all the things that we have heard, seen, read, all the persecution, all the people who have died in the name of, of Christ, throughout the world, throughout the centuries. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sins that so easily ensnare. The things that are holding us back are our own vision, are the things that we're looking at and rejecting that those things are from God. 
Instead of just going through it and say, this is the will of God for me at this moment in time. I will understand it someday. I will go come out of this stronger. I will come out of this understanding God's love for me a little bit more. Because he is the perfecter of my faith. And let us run with perseverance. If it is easy for us to understand, we don't need perseverance. If it is easy for us to discern that it is the will of God, we don't need perseverance. And if it is not long, then we don't need perseverance. The race marked out for us. It is a long journey filled with hardship, and that's why it is requiring us to have perseverance. And not only perseverance, but fixing where our eyes look. So I ran a lot of marathons and half marathons and long distances. <laughs> if I was just, so, just, just to focus on my legs and how tired my body gets, I'd quit. <laughs> Honestly, like I, I remember my first, very first marathon. Uh, you know, my legs, honestly, it, you know, my legs were kicking sideways. You know, like normally you, you and I walk, right? We walk forward. Our legs just does whatever we tell it to do, even subconsciously. When your, body, when your body is so tired, your legs start doing funny things. It starts to jerk, it starts to kick, it starts to, you know, do God knows what, and like, you lose complete control of your body. And it is not until we're simply just fixing, I am just fixing on that finish line. And it's like, I just need to cross that finish line. Who cares what my body does? Because what am I gonna do? I'm gonna collapse here and do what? <laughs> Right, because we're not we're not anywhere. Like I, I was running big, sir. I mean, that's a highway. Uh, and so you know, what do, what do you what do I, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna wait until the truck comes by and pick me up, right? <laughs> what, what is there to do? I'm it's I'm just gonna sit down on the side of the road anyways. Might as well just keep on going. Just take one step at a time. Just keep going. Just fix your eyes upon that finish line. And here is not the finish line. It is a person. It is Jesus. Jesus, I have no idea what's going on. I have no idea what is going on in my life right now. I don't know why I'm struggling so much. I don't know why I'm here. But I believe that you're going to make sense out of all of it. And that requires faith. Maybe it's a greater faith than what we are accustomed to. Maybe it's a greater faith than what we would like to have to experience and endure. But when you are at that low place, just fix your eyes upon Jesus. And say, you have a purpose. You have a reason why I'm going through this. I'm going to believe. I'm going to leave you with that. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for all the things that you have done for us. For all the adversity and, tr and, and trials and difficulties that you have put in place in our lives, Lord. Now, our lives is long and the journey is hard. But Jesus, you're always right there beside us. We pray that you would allow us to continue to believe that you're always next to us, guiding us, bringing us through that baptism of fire, Lord God, that we would then understand your love and the depth of your compassion for each one of us, Lord. You are going to perfect our life, our faith, Lord. Now I pray that you would allow us to have the faith to believe. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.